Hi, thanks so much for joining me today. I think you're going to really enjoy hearing from our special guest, especially if you're into the music of English bands Free and Bad Company. Drummer and songwriter Simon Kirk is best known as the co-founder of that supergroup Bad Company, and he's been the only continuous member since its inception. Simon was also the drummer and co-founder of the band Free. He started it with the incredibly talented late Paul Kossoff. It's a fascinating story and I'll let Simon tell you all about it after I congratulate him for being able to figure out how to use Zoom. Hello. Hi Simon. The wonders of uh, the internet. Ah, amazing. You've joined the 21st century. (laughs) You've got an amazing story to tell, Simon Kirk. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's been quite a ride. Can we talk about that journey that you've been on? Sure. Going right back to the days when you grew up in England and uh, you did a deal with your parents that if you didn't find a job as a drummer, you'd have to go to college. It was by the skin of your neck that you actually found one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. well, it was a two-year deal. And for, for 23 months, I did menial jobs, you know, construction, demolition, bottle washing, car washing, and answering auditions during those two years with no luck. And then really, it was just by the toss of a coin that I got the break because in 1968, there was a big blues boom in England. Every other pub had a blues band. And I saw this great name, Black Cat Bones. I thought, what a great name. But I was way across the other side of London. And it was, a, a, you know, it was two subway rides. I'd have to get two subway trains a long way. So I, th- I tossed a coin, I, you know, heads I go and tails I stay in and write letters home. And it came down heads. So off I went and saw the band. The guitarist was fantastic. And they were auditioning drummers. Their drummer was leaving. And I spoke to Paul. It was Paul Kossoff. And he said, well, if you want to, you know, try your luck, come down tomorrow and audition. And I did. And I got the job. So really, but for that toss of a coin, I'm speaking to you now. So it was purely coincidence that they happened to be auditioning for drummers anyway? Yeah. I mean, I only went because it was such a great name. And it said featuring Paul Kossoff, this diminutive guitar player who was absolutely wonderful. So anyway, that was on the 23rd month of the 24 that my parents had given me. And it was a professional band. And and suddenly I was playing, you know, getting... 20 quid a night which was a fortune it was, it was a weekly wage um, when I got demolition and then after about six months we kind of bonded me and Kosh we became very good friends and he said listen I've just met this great singer he's in another band across town and he wants to form a band you know would you be up for it I said yeah yeah and that was Paul Rogers and we formed free. I want to get to free in just one minute, but were your parents really disappointed that they'd missed out on it by a month? Uh, well, I, there were two camps. There was my dad, who was typically English. He held no truck with rock and roll and all that loud music. And my mum, who was very artistic and very musical, and I think she was happy that I would, I'd gone to the next level and, you know, I'd given it a shot and I'd gone to the next level. So that deal was off, university was off, because this was still only a semi-professional band. It, I mean, it was a professional band, but it wasn't, you know, the big time. So I, I, but I think uh, on the whole, they were glad that, that my uh, investment had, had started to pay off. Yeah, right. And in terms of Paul Kossoff, had you heard of him already as a guitarist? Did you know about what he was like? No, no, he was unknown to me. But, you know, I'd only been in London a few months. Uh, But he was making a name for himself. Number one, because he was incredibly good. Number two, because he was very young. And number three, because he was the son of a famous English actor, David Kossoff. So he had quite a bit going for him. But, I mean, when all that was tossed aside, he was the most incredible guitar player at the age of 17. It was amazing. Just God-given talent. Yeah. Well, he, you know, he, he studied Spanish classical guitar as a teenager, as a younger teenager, and really took to it. And playing classical guitar is very hard. But then he discovered Eric Clapton and the blues back in the mid-60s when he was only about 15. And he took up blues guitar and he just became this astonishingly good and very young player. 
So he'd met Paul Rogers and says to you, come and join another band. What was the attraction of leaving where you were at? Well, I was a little bit on the fence uh, because I just, you know, I just joined this band. They were pretty good. They were, you know, we played standards. It wasn't anything special, but Koss was so enamored of Paul, Paul Rogers. He said, this guy's singing is so good. And, uh, you know, let's at least, let's have a little jam together, the three of us. And I was really taken in with Koss's, uh, and I say Koss because they're both called Paul. So Koss and Paul Rogers. So, you know, just clear that up. So I was taken with Koss's enthusiasm. And we met Paul up in North London. He was in a house and he had a little, it, well, it was a large sitting room and there was a little stage and a drum kit and, and we had a little jam. And as soon as I heard him sing, I went, whoa, wow. That was three quarters of free. And then we got Andy Fraser on bass a couple of weeks later and, and off we went. And you certainly went off with a bang, didn't you? <laughs> well, people say we were an overnight success, but we weren't. We actually slogged around England for about two years, which is a long time when you're playing at least 300 shows a year. So we did the, what we call the transit circuit, you know, that little Bedford van transit circuit. We went all over England, all over Europe, building up a, a fan base. And, uh, and then we got a record deal with Ireland Records. That was, that was huge. That was a big step because they wanted to change their name. They didn't like free. Oh. They said it was too nebulous. You know, promoters were under the impression that you know, you could get in for nothing. They didn't think it was a strong name and they wanted to call us the heavy metal kids. And we said in so many words, uh, go away. And they said, well, then we don't have a deal. And we went, oh, Jesus. But we stuck to our guns. We left the office because he said, well, you're not going to change the name. There's no deal. Oh, shit. Okay. And this was Ireland Records. This was, this had Joe Cocker, Traffic. It was a lovely label and, and uh, you know, to be turned down by them. Anyway, that evening, Chris Blackwell, who was the head of Ireland, called Andy. He was the only guy on the phone and said, you know what? We'll give you six months trial as free and, uh, you know, come and sign the papers tomorrow. Wow. So that was, yeah. Andy Fraser had come off John Mayle's band, hadn't he? He'd been yeah. the bass player for, for them. What an amazing lineup you were. Who settled on the name Free? Where'd that come from? Well, that's a good question. And not many people ask that. So five stars for you there. Um, <laughs> well, we were rehearsing in this pub called the Nags Head. And the very first rehearsal, we just clicked. I mean, the four of us just clicked amazingly. And after a couple of hours, you know, we, we got like five original songs and during a little break this guy alexis corner who was like the godfather of the, of the blues scene and who cost knew andy fraser knew he told he turned us on to andy fraser he said you got to get this kid because he is unbelievable bass player so he popped in to the pub where we were upstairs in a big room and he was knocked out and he said we yeah, had a little break a little ciggy and a beer and he said, well, what are you going to call yourself? He had no idea. And he said, well, look, I was in a band called Free at Last with Graham Bond, who was an organ player, and Ginger Baker, who went on to Cream. But you can't use that, obviously. How about you just call yourselves Free? And we were in the 60s, remember, when you had bands like Yes and Clouds and Art, Spooky too. you know, they were kind of nebulous names and free, just, wow, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. So, yeah, we, we became free. You played around before you became really popular, but yeah. it didn't take that long, did it? Well, it took two years. We, we were formed in May of 1968, and we had the big hit All Right Now in the, the late spring of 1970, during which we, we played everywhere. We played incessantly. But it was all right now that, that, that really broke us in more ways than one, but we'll come to that later. We certainly um, will. I mean, that, was, that, that became number one in, I think, 20, 20 territory. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the backstory to that song. Well, you know, we, we had this sort of style 
this sort of grungy blues style, a little heavy footed, a little, it was more to listen to than to actually dance to. And it was after one particularly slow gig in up north. And we came off, by the time we left the stage, the applause had died. And we had to walk from the stage. There were no dressing rooms in this uh, hall. It was a student's hall. We had to walk through the crowd to the dressing rooms at the back of the hall. And that was one of the longest walks we ever did because everyone was silent and we never had this before. You know, students are a different breed to uh, the, you know, the regular clientele that we were used to playing to. So we got into the dressing room and we were kind of down. And I remember Andy saying, you know, we need a song that people can dance to because of all this do, 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 you can't really dance to it. You can listen to it. Anyway, we need a song that everyone can dance to. And he had this sort of brainwave where he started bopping around the, the, the dressing room, sort of body drumming on his body. All right now, baby, it's all. And we thought, wow, that's, that's nifty. And then him and Paul Rogers, at the end, that evening, went back and to the hotel room, did the bare bones, what became All Right Now. All Right Now was Free's first big hit. It was a huge number one, but it became a bit of an albatross around the guys' necks, both because they were too young to handle success and they weren't able to follow it up. Glad you're still here. I'm chatting with free and bad company drummer Simon Kirk, who's just been telling us about the amazing chemistry that he and Paul Kossoff, Paul Rogers and Andy Fraser shared as members of the group Free. Quite ironically, having a number one hit also caused their downfall. But of course, at the time, they didn't know what lay ahead. Saying it was born from a bad gig, basically. <laughs> That's great. That's testimony to the fact that uh, out of adversity comes good things yeah. sometimes. <laughs> and necessity is the mother of an invention. That's right. Oh, yeah. I, I love yeah. that story. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's put you on the on radio everywhere around the world. Everyone is now dancing to free. What sort of band did you set out to be? It wasn't sort of a dance band in the beginning, was it? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, we look, we just wanted to, we were very much steeped in the blues. And I think, you know, that's that's really what we wanted to be was a kind of alternative blues band, not 12 bar blues every song, but, you know, but blues based. And of course, we were young. We wanted to appeal to girls. I mean, that's one of the reasons blokes get in a band, you know, to, to, to appeal not only to guys, but obviously to girls. We wanted to be popular, and, um, but we didn't want to sell out. We weren't going to become a pop group. But we just needed that song. And I think what saved that song from becoming a sort of cliche pop thing was the, the guitar. The guitar solo was just phenomenal. It was, I think, the best guitar solo that Paul Kossoff ever played. And it sort of elevated above, because we were on top of the pops with all these, you know, glitter bands and whatever. And then suddenly you've got this incredibly bluesy guitar solo. It, it had a little bit of everything, but... Quite honestly, Sandy, that's what we wanted to be, a, a blues band, but with popular Appeal. trapping. Yeah. 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 You wanted it all, and yeah. you got it. For a short yeah. time anyway with that band, what yeah. went wrong? Well, I think we were too young, honestly. We were too young to handle the, the success because instead of playing a, a town every other night or every night, we were now playing a, a country, a different country every night. And, you know, we were in Holland, you know, Amsterdam one night, Brussels the next, Hamburg, back to England. And then America loomed, you know, we had to go and do America. And we were really, we weren't ready. Quite honestly, we were not ready for that level of success. And, and of course, the, the big thing, and one of the biggest reasons was the follow-up. What are you going to follow up all right now with? Because anything, unless it's five stars, is not going to happen and we were under that pressure from the record company and it didn't happen you know we the subsequent album and single after fire and water which was the album all right now is a single taken from the album this the the follow-up album was called highway 
and this single was called Steeler, and they died a death. And it was like, whoa, you know, no one likes us anymore. Oh, dear. And we broke up, basically. We broke up because we couldn't handle the workload. We were only, I was only 19. Andy was 17. Kossoff was 18. And Paul Rogers, six months younger than me. So 19. We were still really kids. And we, Andy Fraser and Paul Rogers were the ones who said, look, if we're not going to have a break, we're going to we're going to pack it in and we're going to do solo stuff and it kind of really threw us for a loop a lot of friction started uh, the writing became more and more uh, diverse even though it said you know it's like lennon mccartney half of the stuff that that was credited to lennon mccartney was was not written by the two of them they were you know disparate groups yeah and that's what happened with andy and paul that they started writing their own songs and they grew further and further apart. And I think we jumped the gun by splitting up. We should have just taken six months off, done what we wanted to do, and said, all right, I'll see you in December, because we broke up, and I believe it was in May. And then Kos developed the drug habit because he was so bereft, you know, he was so shaken by, by the, the, this band that all of a sudden had reached this pinnacle and then just collapsed, imploded. Right. And he really got strung out on various substances and he never really recovered. Mm -hmm. uh, Awful. Simon, so, what would it have looked like? You said you weren't ready to handle that sort of success. Apart from your age, what would have it looked like if you were ready? Well, I think management would have helped a lot. They were more, how can, how can I put it? They were more like an esoterical management they weren't like the peter grant of led zeppelin or mickey most the old school managers these were like almost kind of airy fairy you know we'll let them do what they want right. you know la 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 no one stepped in to this bunch of teenagers and said look you've had a great run have a break you know do what you want you want to go and do a solo album fine we'll do it do whatever you want but Paul Rogers was the first one to say, I don't want to work anymore. And they, they booked in another Japanese tour after he specifically said, I don't want, I need a break. And within a week, they said, oh, by the way, you know, April to May, you're going to be in Japan. And he hit the roof. I mean, he went crazy. And justifiably so. So it was a little, you know, the Ireland were a great management on paper. But when it came to handling us, they dropped the ball, quite honestly. And it was, yeah. never, really, it was never the same. I've heard that said many times about the record labels, that they were much more interested in the profits than they were in the people. Oh, yeah. And I, I guess yeah. understandably so. Yeah. But, uh, well, they're, you know, they're, they're a business and they're there to make money. But when you, when you, you sort of rub up against, you know, kids who are very, you haven't fully formed yet. You know, they're not grown up and they tend to be, you know, like all teenagers, we're rebellious and we think, come, you know, if they want to do that to us, then, then you know, we'll, you, we'll go our own way. Yeah. Very, very knee-jerk reaction, you yeah. know. And unfortunately, it, it really, free was never the same, even though we reunited about a year later because costs were so bad and, our, our solo projects hadn't done anything. So we, we got back really to, to get Koss back together again. And, but he was so strung out and he never, he never really recovered. What was it like coming back with him then? Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. He was, so, he was so screwed up. And nowadays, you know, most people know someone who's been in rehab. It's not a big deal. So you have a drug problem, so you take care of it. And, and it's, you know, so what? But back in those days, 50 years ago, Sandy, if you were a drug addict, you were a pariah, you know, you were, you know, no one wanted to know you. And, yeah. and, and, and it was all kept hush hush and swept under the carpet because it was a stigma. There was so much stigma attached yeah. Yeah. to being an alcoholic or drug addict. Didn't his parents try and reclaim it? Well, he'd had trouble with drugs before, of course, as a 15-year-old. He got into speed. You know, they were all doing these things called blues, adrenamil. 
and everyone was taking uppers and whatever. And he got pretty strung out. So knowing what I do know about addiction, because I'm one myself, I mean, I've been, I've been, I don't mind telling people I've been in and out of several rehabs. Knowing what I know about addiction now, Koss was an addict from day one, but he never received the proper treatment. You know, he had this epileptic seizure uh, on stage and we just canceled the tour and put him in his little apartment for three weeks to dry out. No supervision, no medical care, no aftercare. It's crazy. Yeah. Knowing what I know now, it's just, ah. So, yeah. By 1973, we'd had two years of slogging, dragging this, what became the carcass of free around. And by 73, we said, uh, we're done. And we all <clears throat> exploded into various parts of the world and came back, uh, me and Paul came back with Mick Rouse and took off with Bad Company. Which again was a, a, a whole huge story, wasn't it? So you couldn't keep good guys down, that's for sure. Oh. Uh, so that was 1973. And as you said, you meet up with Mick Ralphs, who'd been playing with Mott the Hoople, as well as Boz Burrell, uh, who'd come out of King Crimson. Yeah. What well, sort see, of a Mick, Mick had been with Mott, and Mott had been on Island Records. So we kind of, Free and Mott kept sort of crossing paths in in you know in the offices hey man how you doing la 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 love that album and so on so we kind of knew him and he was such a lovely guy i love mick he was genial he was funny he wasn't a genius guitar player but we were fed up with playing with geniuses geniuses are hard work sandy <laughs> i know <laughs> you know they're hard bloody work so along comes mick and and what happened was he he was leaving mock the hoople and they did a, a tour and Paul, Paul Rogers had a little solo band called Peace. And he, he opened up for Mott the Hoople on this English tour. And every, you know, him and Mick formed this relationship, this, this friendship. And they would play a little, they would jam together after the show. And, and Mick says, you know, I'm fed up with Mott. I want to form a band. I've got this song that, that Ian Hunter won't sing. And it was called Can't Get Enough. He had this little reel-to-reel -reel tape and he had a little recorder and he put it on in some dressing room. And Paul went, this is a hit. This is amazing. And, and, and he started singing along with it. And Mick told me years later, when he started singing along to the tape, his, the hair just stood on end because he just, you know, anything that Paul sings becomes... Majestic. And that was Can't Get Enough, which turned into a huge hit for us. Yeah, that was 1974. That was that came off the debut album, Bad yeah. Company. And right. again, you well, you were several years older, not that many years older. You were yeah, now what 25. in your early 20, you were 25. Yeah, me and Paul were 25. Mick was a few years older. Mick was born in 44, so he would have been 30. So he was kind of the old statesman. Boz, we never really found out how old Boz was, but I think he was uh, he was 46. Uh, he was born in 46, so he would have been 30 as well. So you had uh, we, you know, we had we had a, an amazing band, coupled with the fact that we were managed by Peter Grant and Led Zeppelin had their debut, their swan song album label, their label, and it was just a perfect storm when it all came together. And you were the first group to be signed to that record label, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Bad Company was off and running, and the best was yet to come. By the time the ex-members of Free, Mott the Hoople and King Crimson came together as Bad Company, they were older, more experienced and a whole lot wiser. It was great. We had an amazing management. We were seasoned veterans, even though we were relatively young. You know, we'd had five years in the business, or the peaks and valleys, you know. And we were actually in a band that ironically was had a lot more freedom than Free ever had. And I maintain to this day that from 74 to 80, they were the best years. Bad Company for the first six, seven years was just phenomenal. We, we could do no wrong. Peter was very supportive. Zeppelin were a bit like big brothers to us. You know, they came to shows. They had a vested interest in us because they were all investors in Swansong. You know, it was their label. 
but they became mates. I have to ask you, though, too, the origins of the name Bad Company. It's such a flip from uh -huh. free. It is. Well, there are two schools of thought. And I remember being in Paul Rogers' cottage down in the country, and I'd stayed behind. They'd gone into town, and Paul came back. And he said, I've just seen this billboard advertising this movie, Jeff Bridges' movie called Bad Company. And he said, that'd be a great name for the band. I said, yeah, fuck yeah, wonderful name. So we wrote to Warner Brothers because uh, Peter Grant said, if it's copywritten, you might have a problem. So we called them up in LA and Peter Grant said, well, we want to use it for our band. And some snide guy said, yeah, yeah, well, they probably won't be around in six months. And Peter Grant said in, in his own inimitable way, well, we'll soon effing see about that. And here we are 50 years later. The other school, I have to say that Paul Rogers was looking through an old Victorian book and apparently there were a bunch of guys hanging around a smoky lamppost on a London street at night. And it said something like, this is what you should be scared of. This is bad company. So that's where he says he got it from. So you have both. <laughs> Wherever it came from, it certainly worked. <laughs> didn't it? It, yeah. And Simon, you started writing yourself at that time too. Yeah, I've been playing guitar as long as I've been playing drums. And it, 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 I've been playing drums since I was 13. So that's 60 years because the neighbours were complaining about me drumming. We had a little terrace house and they complained and we went to family court because of the noise. And the judge was one of these old fashioned blokes, you know, with the little glasses. And I didn't go. My father went and he said, well, tell your son that he can practice for half an hour at night, only half an hour. And only when he's finished his homework, <laughs> he banged the gavel and next, next case. So that was it after half an hour. And I was just getting warmed up. And then dad would come up and say, sorry, Simon, no more. And I was like, ah. So my brother, who'd been in the army in Germany, had brought back a guitar that he left in the room when he was home on leave. And it was an electric guitar, no amp. And I just started picking it up and playing along to records just to satisfy my musical... Urges. Urges, yeah. So I learned guitar and that's when I started writing songs. All right. But she'd been part of Free and then in the initial parts of Bad Company, solely providing drums. Was there a certain time when you said, OK, now I'm going to start writing with you too? Or was that a gradual well, process? I, I, I've always written for myself, Sandy, quite honestly. Uh, whatever I like, you know, and hopefully if the other guys like it, that's been the cross that I bear. It's just I like writing, but I don't I can't write to tailor made songs. There was one song. Love You So. It was about the second or third song I ever wrote. And I was playing it in the van. And Paul actually said, wow, that's nice. And I went, oh, wow, OK, thanks. He said, do you want me to sing it? This is the first song I ever wrote that he sang. And it was just wonderful. He did such a lovely job. I'm like the George Harrison. You know, I write a song a year. But it's pretty good. And uh, that really gave me a lot of confidence to write other songs. and. And now I've written, you know, about 300 songs. You did write the title track to Bad Company, the debut album, didn't you? Yeah. Well, me and Paul did that. That's a funny story because he'd just taken delivery of this huge grand piano. He'd had it installed in his little cottage and it took up two rooms. It was enormous. And I came down for a rehearsal and I heard this thing being played. And I walked in and there he is at this sort of mad professor playing this little down, down, down. And I said, wow, that's nice. And they said, yeah, yeah, I've got this image. Well, back in those days, it was Clint Eastwood, Fistful of Dollars, Tumbleweed, riders crossing the plain, you know, looking for bail bondsmen. Oh, yeah, it was that sort of Western image. Yeah. And Paul had this idea of, of bad company, a bunch of outlaws being chased <laughs> across the plains, you know. And <laughs> we just sort of sat around and had a little joint and a little beer and, I think we wrote it in 20 minutes. Yeah, it was great. Simon, you're the only member of Bad Company who's been in every single lineup of the band, and you've worked with some amazing people over the years. You've guested on recordings for Wilson Pickett, yeah. Jim Capaldi, Ron Wood, Ray Charles, Bo Diddley. You've toured with Ringo Starr and with Joe Walsh. You've also been doing your own solo records. Can you tell us a yeah. little about those? 
Well, I had all these songs just sitting around really gathering dust. And I had this theory that unless I put them out, then that would leave more room for other songs to, to come in. And it, it, that actually worked. My first album was called Seven Rays of Hope. And that, there were several songs that dealt with addiction and recovery. And I'm still very much involved with a couple of organizations that help kids and artists and musicians recover from addiction. When I see kids getting sober and they're only 17 or 18, I go, wow. I just found it very cathartic to put all these songs out. I've done three solo albums. I plan on doing another. I can really do what I want. I can have the musicians I want. It gives me freedom to really do what I want. And if they sell, they sell. And if they don't, it's not really a big deal for me. Do you have a favourite track that we could listen to? Well, I, I would be in big trouble if I didn't mention my wife, Maria. And I have a lovely song. I had that done with, with the string quartet. Ever since I heard yesterday, Paul McCartney, I've always wanted to do a song with a string quartet. And it's about as far removed from bad company as you can get. It's written for the woman I love, my wife, Maria. Isn't she a lucky lady? What happened to bad company? We're still in existence. I mean, we're not, we're not hanging it up yet. We played our last show in Vegas, October of um, 19... No, 19. 2019. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit like that, isn't oh, it? <laughs> yeah. And thank God it was one of the best gigs we ever played because we've had to live with that memory. I'd imagine you've been writing some material in the interim. Yeah, I've scored a couple of little movies. I really want to get into uh, movie scoring. Simon Kirk, you're also on the board of the Grammy Awards. I you am, play a big yeah. part there. That's an amazing position. Yeah. Of, of the four shows, you know, the, the Oscars, the Emmys and the Tonys, the Grammys is the, the sort of bastard child. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to get into it now. But, yeah, I am on the board. And I'm a, a proud card-carrying member. And we just do what we can, you know. Again, it's probably too big a question now for me to say, what do you think of music today? Well, I, look, as long as there are teenagers, there'll be rebellious music. And I think the state of music is pretty good right now. It's just, I think computers have taken over a little bit too much. It's all loops now and beats and it's pretty healthy. Which bands do you think they'll be talking about in 50 years' time? Bloody hell. That's a good... That's oh, I can't think I, of any. For 15 years' time, I, you know, maybe. Maybe, the, you know, the Foo Fighters have been together now nearly 25 years. So I used to think of them as new. Same with the Chili Peppers. There's nothing really that stands out to me right now. I'm sure they're out there. Just, we just don't know about know, them. I'm sorry, we don't know. <laughs> We're yet to find out. Simon, are you still in touch with Paul Rogers? Yeah, I actually just, uh, I got an email from only a couple of days ago. He lives up in Canada. We do keep in touch. We're good mates. Great. Yeah, no one else can be in the band. Uh, if, if I'm not in it or Paul's not in it, then by contract and by mutual uh, desire, it won't be bad company. Great. Bad company's closed shop. Yes, it is. <laughs> Simon Kirk, great to chat with you. I really appreciate your time oh, and, and your stories. Thank you so much. And uh, send my best to your wife, Maria. She's a lucky lady. Thank you, Sandy. Simon, bye. bye now. Thank you. Bye. What a lovely man, free and bad company drummer and co-founder Simon Kirk is. Gosh, those bands made some fabulous music, didn't they? As Simon mentioned, he's still putting out solo albums, so do check them out. You'll find all the details on his website, which is officialsimonkirk.com. Thanks again for joining me today. I really appreciate your company, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing the story of free and bad company. Can I count on you joining me again same time next week? I hope so. I'll see you then.